thing. It's very difficult because 24 hours without reading matter for me. They confiscate your phone. The only book allowed inside is the Quran in Arabic, which is a given that I don't read Arabic. Um, you know, it was 24 hours of kind of sensory deprivation. Um, but I knew, in fairness, OK, it was tolerable for me because I knew as a Brit there were diplomatic channels through which you could go to get some sort of redress. What was slightly terrifying is there are people in there who are, for example, Nepalese or Filipino. Now, you know, I don't imagine that the Nepalese embassy or the Filipino embassy carries quite the same clout uh, with the authorities. Uh, but also, you know, they were in there for things like having a girlfriend. OK. There were people in prison because, you know, they had basically been in the presence of a person of the opposite sex who wasn't an immediate blood relative without a chaperone being present. And bang, that for both male and female, that's a jailable offence. Um, there's something I'm very interested in, which is the um, potential for turning flexible work to your advantage. Okay. Uh, both as, you know, both in terms of attracting high quality employees, um, but also in terms of genuinely revolutionising productivity. Mm. Because I don't think I don't think we're we're making intelligent comparisons um, at the moment in that. What people tend to do is they ask the rather stupid question, uh, would a one hour Zoom call, is it better than or worse than a face to face meeting? <laughs> well, in some senses, if teleportation were possible and arguably if there were some fantastic metaverse, yes, the three dimensional equivalent would be better in and of itself. But then if it took three weeks longer to organize, or if it cost £10,000 in travel costs, so it didn't happen at all, okay, then a meeting that doesn't happen at all, unless you're very pessimistic about meetings, is worse than a meeting that's 10% worse than the theoretically optimal meeting, which would have happened in a perfect world where you had an unlimited travel budget and unlimited discretionary time on the part of the five people who needed to participate. For sure. There are other wider questions, of course, which is... Um, the extent to which you can engage people for small slivers of time, that once you remove travel from the equation, you can call on an expert anywhere in the world to give their advice or commentary for an hour on anything and pay them commensurately for an hour. Whereas if you require their physical presence, you know, someone on the other side of the Atlantic, a trip to meet you in London, regardless of the travel cost, is three days out of their calendar. It's three days of opportunity cost. It's a week where they can't go on holiday. It's a week where they can't take any other possibly more lucrative alternative engagements. Whereas if they commit to an hour on Zoom, literally, that doesn't prevent them from doing anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, you know, I'm on technically sort of on holiday at the moment. I have absolutely no problem doing a one hour podcast with you while I'm on holiday. And later on, I might go to the beach and buy an ice cream. But if you'd asked me to come into London to do this, I would have said no. And you would have ended up doing the podcast in October. OK, so but there are other, other benefits, quite simply, which is that if you um, the typical Londoner, 50 percent of their after tax income is spent on um, accommodation and transportation costs. If you can reduce that by only 20 percent or even more, possibly, if you can reduce those by 30 percent, that would represent a 15 um, uh, percent increase in after tax income, hmm. which would do quite a bit to offset a cost of living crisis, inflation in the energy market and everything else. But then it's also good, I would argue, for businesses, the more discretionary income consumers have. Generally, unless you're transport for London or a buy to let landlord, you stand to benefit quite a lot from that change. It's, yeah, it's quite I, a paradox. I, I think it's a thing. Very interesting statistic, by the way. Every single Futurology podcast you will ever see assumes greater agglomeration, greater urbanization, high rise living, mass transit, okay? Um, effectively, um, 
uh, futurologists have just got obsessed with the idea that the future consists of the entire world's population living in megacities. Mm. But with the right form of transportation and with the right form of technology, um, people in megacities often aren't very happy. Um, Switzerland, 50% of the Swiss population lives in a town or settlement with a population less than 10,000 people. Um, generally, there's quite a lot of evidence that shows that people's levels of happiness are higher if they live in small towns because you repeatedly bump into the same people with whom, whom you form relationships. There's a kind of manageable sense of community and so on. But then there's a final thing which I only learned, which I, I, I'd also like to mention, which I, I only learned this week, which was a colleague of mine who worked for, and I can't remember who it was, a very senior advertising creative uh, in the 1970s and 80s, simply gave this bit of advice about managing staff. They said, Managing staff is quite easy when you understand what motivates them. And he said, generally, it comes down to three things, not necessarily one of those three things. It could be two or more, but generally one of those things will be disproportionately dominant. And the three things are money, power and autonomy. And it occurred to me that we have businesses that are very well structured to reward the urge to power. They're pretty well structured to urge to actually recognize the rewards to greed, but they're very, very bad at understanding those people, probably a minority of people, but it's a minority which includes myself, whose predominant motivation is probably autonomy. Mm. That in other words, the freedom to work where I like at a time of day that suits me and to occasionally take leisure or to travel without being entirely constrained by the patterns of the conventional working day, it's simply disproportionately valuable to me. Uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you said, okay, you're back to five days a week of commuting, uh, how much money would you want uh, mm -hmm. to compensate you for that? My answer would be basically enough money to retire in three years, because that's about as long as I could stand it for. How do you? So I, you know, I'm very, I'm very, very interested. I'm very, very interested. I, I'm quite friendly, um, for example, with um, Julia Hobsbawm, who's written this book, The Nowhere Office, and I'd very highly recommend her as a as a guest on the podcast as well. Mm. But that autonomy question interests me because it does strike me as plausible. There are people who have a management urge. I don't very much. I have an influence urge. I wouldn't like it if I were routinely ignored but I don't have a power urge particularly. I'm also not disproportionately uh, greedy. Um, you know, I, I, I like having a level of discretionary wealth, which means that, to be honest, once you reach a certain level of wealth, you can, broadly speaking, meet on an equal footing with people 10 times richer than you. Mm. Okay, if you're earning £20,000 a year, the commercial and life experience of people earning £200,000 a year is unrecognisable to you. If you earn £100,000 a year, maybe £200,000 a year, depends on whether you're a family, when I'm looking at household income or not. Actually, people who earn a million pounds a year, in reality, don't live all that differently to you. So there is, there is undoubtedly a, what you might call diminishing marginal utility to wealth. I would argue. I would also argue that you reach a point where uh, more money is less valuable to you than more leisure with which to enjoy the money you already have. That actually there must there must be some sort of intersection point, some sort of crossing point where people would benefit more from more leisure than they would from more money. Um, it may even be in some cases more leisure because then they could earn money in other ways. Mm -hmm. OK. And diversify. But at that, um, at that intersection point, um, it's worth noting that until now, there hasn't really been a mechanism for anybody to make that trade off without effectively saying goodbye to career progression, because it would have been treated as a mark of laziness or lack of commitment. Uh, I don't think that's true anymore. It's also worth noting one final thing, which is people don't know what their friends and colleagues earn, but they do know what their lifestyles are like. 
thanks to social media, thanks to conversation. It's not, you know, I'm not making it a matter of secrecy that I'm in a flat in deal at the moment, okay? I'm not going to tell you what I earn, okay? Now, the point I make there is that uh, there is a form of tacit unionization going on, which is the people who enjoy the most generous uh, lifestyle autonomy and flexibility from their employers are probably setting the comparative bar for everybody else. Mm. Um, it would be extremely difficult for any organization um, which does not, for obvious reasons, require the constant physical presence of its employees um, to uh, actually demand that. Um, it would also be, I think, for those employees where a degree of variety is probably conducive to productivity, it would also be a mistake to demand it because the open plan office, I think, was a particularly bad idea for that reason. It doesn't give you the space or the opportunity to hack your environment. If you had an office, you could open the door, you could close the door. It sounds a very trivial observation, but that enabled you to conduct two modes of work, you know, solitude and concentration versus sociability and collaboration. They're both essential components to many, many people's work, not everybody's, but the fact that you have no control over which mode you're in and are forced to exist in this kind of no man's land between sociability and solitude, I think has been a fundamental mistake in terms of office and knowledge worker productivity. I saw you um, on another podcast. Like it might have been um, one with my friend David McIntosh. You were talking about how our communication and that we probably don't have a a lot, um, you know, of, of new forms of communication to invent. But then, you know, there's something that appears like the like the metaverse, and you were talking about um, you know productivity in the workplace. I watched a trailer the other day um, for the Metaverse boardroom where these, you know, big corporate meetings are taking place inside the Metaverse where everyone is represented by an avatar. avatar. Yeah. What, do you feel as though something like that where you're represented by an avatar would be able to allow the you know the sense of connection the sense of empathy that something like a big boardroom meeting would need to have to be effective in my opinion um i wonder if it'll ever work if it requires a headset hmm. uh, if, it, if it can be done through some sort of interface not totally dissimilar from google glass or perhaps is much more heavily weighted towards augmented reality than virtual reality okay uh, I wouldn't say never. My only quibble with that, now bear in mind, uh, isn't David McIntosh great, by the way? I, was, I, I had a wonderful podcast with him. I thought he was fantastic. He was amazing, yeah. Um, I thought, I, I think that there's, it's, Facebook, okay, has to, for strategic reasons uniquely pertaining to Facebook, has to persuade that there is a next big thing where it can own the hardware and the software rather than renting space on the web or mm. on mobile devices, okay? Essentially at the mercy of Google, etc. you know, Apple, and so on. It also has to be make absolutely clear that it's not going to be wrong-footed by the next big thing. So it has to make a disproportionate investment in this prediction on the grounds that otherwise its stock price would suffer because people would effectively discount it on the grounds that it was always vulnerable to a virtual reality alternative, okay? However, from the point of view of a business that isn't Facebook, I would argue that time spent talking about video conferencing, um, time spent talking about new patterns of work enabled by video conferencing, and also time spent making better use relatively of the different communication channels that exist between people in business and the world of work, which goes all the way from WhatsApp to texting to phone calls to Zoom to face-to-face -face meetings to uh, international conferences to, you know, um, uh, seminars and, and, you know, and, and webinars and talks. We would make much better use of our time debating what's now available and here and real 
and how to respond to it and experimenting with those spaces rather than spending our time agreeably hypothesizing about a future which may never exist mm. and in any case won't exist in significant form for the next three or four years. Mm. And so I think, um, you know, uh, well, you know, I'm old enough to remember Second Life, so I bring a degree of scepticism uh, to the assumptions that we necessarily want to interact in a 3D environment. Uh, I'm old enough at the age of 56, every 20 years or so, uh, somebody brings back 3D TV, and every 20, uh, 20 years or so, the market seems to decide that it doesn't want it, hmm. okay, for whatever reason. And you could argue, well, it's not enough content. You could argue that um, we actually don't want content to be wholly immersive. You know, I, I, just to give an example, I wouldn't wear a headset on a train because I'd be frightened that someone would attack me or nick my laptop. Okay. Mm. Whereas I'll happily watch a film on a, on a on a train while retaining my peripheral vision. Yeah. You know, there are a whole there are a whole bunch of deep psychological factors which we might have to factor in. Not you know, not these mm. that historically it often made people sick. Okay. You know, if 20 to 30 percent of people basically are made to feel sick by donning these headsets, well, you've patently got a problem for any meeting lasting longer than 25 minutes. Since say what you like about face to face meetings, there generally wasn't much vomiting involved. Mm. And um, so I, I, so my great annoyance is that I think if I were running a company now, I would say, do we have a comparative advantage? So I would argue. Ogilvy, by dint of its culture, and Ogilvy did very well creatively and pretty well financially during the pandemic, okay? I would argue that one of the questions we must ask ourselves straight off is, if we have a comparative advantage through culture in enabling remote and flexible working, which will allow us to attract much of the best talent through offering flexibility and autonomy rather than necessarily offering money and power, okay? Because money and power in some ways are in scarce supply. You can tax money, but you can't really tax autonomy. It's a very tax-efficient benefit to give your workforce. Mm. And um, if we can actually do that better than our competitors can, then we should actually see this as being a major and enduring source of competitive advantage over competing ad agencies. And the same applies to, you know, a bank or a tech firm or anything of the kind. Now, the most extreme case, I think, is um, probably Airbnb, which has gone flexible forever. But it is worth noting that if your core um, uh, um, strapline as Airbnb is be at home anywhere, okay, uh, you know, they have actually painted themselves into a bit of a corner with that one, it might be said. And, you know, I'm not sure I'd ever go that extreme. There are also, of course, huge tax implications if people are working in London but living in Portugal for substantial amounts of time. You know, that brings with it tax implications. It's also, by the way, very different in the UK to the US. Yeah. Because in the US, broadly, where are you in Wales, by the way? I'm in a town called Pont de Prith in the valleys okay. of South Wales. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Now you can you you know you, you can live in Pont de Prith, right? You can not easy, but you can go to London for the you probably where would you go? Newport, but you're Cardiff. I'm just trying to well, Cardiff. Oh, you probably go to Cardiff, but you you can go to London for the day, right? Yeah, it'd be a pain in the ass if you had to get in at nine, okay? And you get home a bit late, but from Pont de Prith, okay, you couldn't do that from North Wales. You couldn't do it from the north of Scotland. Um, you know, with Edinburgh, you need a plane or a sleeper. But nonetheless, most of the UK is effectively, you know, you can do most other parts of most other populous parts of the UK can be obtained at a day trip. OK, yeah. it's not people moving from San Francisco to, to Austin, Texas mm. or from Montana. That's a diff that's an order of magnitude different. And so for people to move out, if it solves property prices, which I see as being the huge, great, I don't see it as a source of wealth, as that guy, I see it as a massive wealth sump, where 
disproportionate amounts of, of what could be produ economically productive wealth are being sunk into the purchase or rental of property. And if this genuinely um, accelerates a collapse in both commercial and residential property prices, or at least reduces the price people have to pay for property because they can move further afield. And it's worth noting, by the way, that um, area equals pi r squared, right? I mean, the area you can live in within 10 miles of London is exponentially bigger, or 20 miles of London or 30 miles of London grows exponentially. OK, the green belt slightly messes up that theory, but you, you get my point. If people can live beyond the green belt, for example, and commute into London twice a day, with, twice a week with two off-peak tickets because they work in the morning and travel in for lunchtime and then stay till seven o'clock and travel home on a late train, that would essentially bring with it a fairly interesting levelling in terms of property prices. Um, and we're also free up London, by the way, for the people who want to live there, not the people who have to live there. And in London, it, this is an interesting survey because it's about what I would have expected, actually slightly higher than I would have expected. They asked Londoners the question, do you agree or disagree with the statement, it's not worth living in London unless your work requires you to live there and work there? And the answers basically divided a third, a third, a third. A third agreed, a third were not sure, didn't know, and a third disagreed. Now, that does suggest that, you know, roughly speaking, let's be optimistic. You know, there are 30 percent of people who now they only need to travel into London sporadically, would pr uh, probably have it in their mind now to move out. And the other thing is that moving out fundamentally because more people are doing it has become less unfashionable. So, you know, there's always a, you know, a very, very large component of fashion in all human behavior. And so, you know, the idea of moving out, now you have a reason, okay? Because what was the reason you moved out of London and, you know, and took up a five-day commute? Well, implicitly, it was you couldn't hack it in London or whatever it was, you know, okay? Whereas now, you said, I used to live in London because it was uh, convenient for my work, but now I only need to be in the office three days a week or two days a week. There's a very big difference, by the way. It's much more extreme than you realize when you realize that, let me get this right. It's the ratio of two and a half to 0 0.4, which is a ratio of about five or six to one, right? And this is the ratio, right? If you move to Brighton in 19, in, in well, let's make it easier. If you move to Brighton in 2019, you had five days of a grueling commute in return for two days by the seaside, okay? If you move to Brighton now, it's five days by the seaside and the price you pay is two days of a grueling commute. Mm. And that is, if you think about it, it used to be, um, uh, you know, it, yeah, it used to it's five sevenths to, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a very, very big ratio because it's not just a ratio of time travel, which is obviously a five to two ratio. It's also a ratio of the time you get to enjoy your actual new location hmm. and so yeah it's, what was it? it's the ratio of, uh, of, of 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 yeah i guess, I guess it is well you could say two out of five to five out of, you know but, but it's a much much bigger the upside you get moving out is bigger as well as the downside being lower so we should think of this as a multiplier not just as a simple linear effect hmm. before we um carry on down this product i just want to backtrack you mentioned um you mentioned second life there a while ago and it and it triggered this this memory from a tv show i watch um it's the american version of the office and there's a character that's so bogged down by his normal life that he starts to play second life and his habits translate into second life to the point where his character starts playing a game called second second life because he's been recreating the habits do you think that we are, say the metaverse did reach its full potential, would be would we be destined to sort of replicate the same problems that drive us away from reality in the first place? Very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> um, because I am not, okay, I'm pretty happy, broadly speaking, 
okay? This does not mean I'm completely comfortable with free access to pornography. It does not mean I'm completely comfortable with free access to violent video games. But I'm fairly comfortable with the belief that the behaviors, that the brain can discriminate between watching and doing, okay? And that what makes things habitual is often the doing, okay? I, 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 if, I, if I forced people to put cardboard tubes into their mouth and inhale a lot of the time, I'd be much more worried about them taking up smoking than if you merely got them to watch a lot of people smoking on a screen, okay? Right? And they are, they are in some way fundamentally different. And the great guru of this at Goldsmiths, whose name I've briefly forgotten, but she's a wonderful uh, uh, speaker on, an expert on virtual reality, has got research which shows that what you do in, um, in virtual reality can carry through into your real life yeah. much more than happens when you consume content in 2D. Okay. Now, in some respects, that can be very good news in terms of mental health, perhaps, you know, uh, in terms of, for example, people who are frightened of flying. I can see that VR might play a major role in a way that just watching watching film of a plane taking off might not cure your anxiety to the extent of actually experiencing it in virtual reality. Fear of heights, phobias, anxieties. I can see that that may have beneficial effects. But in terms of the behaviours it inculcates online and the thought that those might carry through to real life, I would be more concerned about VR porn, violent porn, by a long shot, than I would be about 2D porn. And I'm not saying, by the way, that I'm unconcerned by that. I'm merely saying that there may be a fairly significant degree. But there's also, as you said, the fact that the same thing could actually... Someone who is neurotically house-proud, okay... You know, you could argue there are two possible, you know, there are two possible things. They become really slovenly in Second Life just for a change. My hunch is that people who are house proud also tidy their desktops fairly assiduously yeah. in what is, after all, a virtual, you know, um, skewamorphic env desktop environment. OK, so you're perfectly right that actually you could very well also carry through the very, you know, the very things that are trying to escape because the deep down problem is, as, as Alan de Botton always says about holidays, which is that when you imagine a holiday, you imagine yourself escaping yourself. Yeah. But all the anxieties, yeah, not all of them, but you know, a, a sizable percentage of the anxieties that plague you while you're at home will also plague you when you're staying in a hotel or wandering down a beach. Mm. You know? you know, you'll find yourself on the beach. And this is made worse, by the way, by mobile devices, which is another thing we need to talk about, which is, you know, are some of the problems, I think, that have arisen through um, this extraordinary, as I mentioned to David, okay, this, you know, I mean, I, bear in mind as a kid, okay, just to be, you know, this is when I was a child. We had three, not four, channels of television. Channel four came along when I was about a teenager, I think, okay. There were three channels of television. There was no fax machine, even. There were letters, which took a day to arrive, typically. Um, uh, there was radio, and there was a telephone. And I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. There was a telex, if you were, you know, a, a, a real outlier. You know, businesses would use telexes as a form of precursor to fax. But interestingly, okay, we have seen this insane explosion in what you might call social platforms. And what is undoubtedly true is we haven't really mastered the etiquette or the appropriateness around it. So that, for example, people will send me urgent things, highly time sensitive things by email. The net result of this is not many people do it, and it only happens occasionally, but the net effect of this is I have to check my email with a completely unproductive regularity, just in case someone has sent me one of these messages saying, you know, as once happened, you, I was I was on the point of flying up to it, to Scotland in a massive storm. Had I actually made the journey, I would have actually been trapped there for not that I mind being trapped in Scotland, but this was trapped in a Scotland without electricity in some parts and with no way of getting home. I've been trapped there for three days. They sent the message saying that the meeting I was travelling for had been cancelled by email. 
and it was only I was already at the airport. It was only the fact that my PA picked it up, picked it up, and phoned me up that that gave me the opportunity to bunk out. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have been sitting on a plane. I would have landed to the news that basically my entire journey was a waste of time and carbon. And um, so, you know, we use these the, the 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 calibration of how we communicate through which which, which communication channel is uneven between people, uh, it, then, um, which causes problems in and of itself. You know, personally, I think the person who sent me that email was a complete fucking idiot. But you have <laughs> to people to communicate that way, and we are then obliged to check our email with kind of almost neurotic regularity. And uh, we also read emails the wrong way around when you think about it. We tend to read them for the most recent first. Now, there's a reason for that, which is there's no point in reading an email if people have subsequently replied to it. But actually, we should probably have a system where the last responded to email is the one at the top of the inbox. OK. But instead, we weirdly reply to the most recent email first, yeah. even if it's not very important or very urgent. And that, you know, when you when you tot up the sort of stupid productivity uh, problem that that arises simply through that weird pattern of of reading, you know, if you think about it, we wouldn't have done that with letters, would we? Typically, okay, if we had, if we came back if we came back home probably for a holiday and we had a means of sorting our letters, we would probably read the earliest ones first to preserve the narrative. But no, we read emails backwards. And an awful lot of this stuff, unsurprisingly, because it's all happened very, very fast, um, has been adopted in a very stupid way, which is why I would argue that debating about modes of communication and how you can use them, uh, not only to your individual or corporate advantage, but to also to the lifestyle and quality of life advantage of everybody around you. I'm doing a thing at the moment where I don't read email every other day. Now, yeah. I'll let you the secret. Sometimes I do. The point of that out of office, or what you might call 50% out of office auto reply, is simply to say, um, uh, if you're thinking you can use this channel to send me something that's time sensitive within hours rather than days, think again. Right. And I don't, I specifically don't say which days I'm reading the email and which days I'm not. Yeah. Interestingly, if everybody did that, it would completely solve the problem of the stupidly urgent email. Mm. It should be a phone call, at the very least a text. Yeah. Yeah. I With the email thing, I remember I used to have alerts on my emails for my phone for the podcast. So as soon as someone emailed me, I would be able to, you know, respond. And I, you know... I found myself distracted whenever I had an email it was like a, a hit of dopamine I'd go straight to it I'd ignore whatever I was doing so I decided to turn the alerts off and check at sort of dedicated times of the day but now I seem to find that it sort of counteracted itself because I'm always checking and refreshing my email no, I, I mean it is, it is really really good just to actually say okay I'm going to have whole four hour windows where I don't check it at all mm. um uh and I, I, th I think email is actually, uh, you know, um, because it's worth noting also collective productivity. It, you know, in a way, anything that requires the agreement or consensus of three or four people is delayed to taking about a week. Mm. Whereas in a Zoom call, it could be agreed immediately, for example. Yeah. Okay. One of the most valuable facets of Zoom, you know, that's, you know, it's not just that it's free and it doesn't require travel time. It's at least synchronous. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever bought a house, but the whole process of buying a house is painful because it's asynchronous. You can never get the vendor, the vendor solicitor, the estate agent. They never get into the room at the same time. So you're left with them effectively passing documents one to the other. And all it takes is one of those bastards to go on holiday and the whole process is held up by another week. Yeah, happened to me. Every time I've bought a house, which is only about three times, uh, I've always thought if only we could just get all these people in the same room together, you know, we could hammer this out in a third of the time. And it's worth noting that individually busy people, individually productive people can nonetheless be part of a very unproductive organization. If the time it takes to get from busy, if the time it takes to proceed from busy person number one to busy person number five is three weeks, 
it doesn't matter that all those people are snowed under and as far as they are concerned doing a wonderful job of processing their intray the fact remains that the organization as a whole is still useless hmm. but we often optimize for the wrong thing we optimize for individual effort actually an efficient organization will allow every single uh, bottleneck component of that of a process to have a degree of slack in it because if you don't have a degree of slack in it that then effectively you've got an organization which is spectacularly inflexible do you find that sometimes especially in the personal development space people tend to sort of optimize for optimize sake or biohack for biohack sake i remember i was speaking to um a, a buddhist monk on this podcast before and i was i was talking about the obsession people have with biohacking and you know trying to live forever and, and and they're always looking into it and he said to me it's a shame when people spend so long trying to figure out how to live longer that they forget to just live life and i think that's the case even with optimization yeah we well what we tend to do is we optimize for I mean, it's worth noting you can do all the right things and, you know, life can be cruelly arbitrary, you know. You know well, um, um, the friend of mine who died youngest was also the fittest friend. It was the cruelty of a brain tumour. Mm. Uh, far and away, the fittest person I've known, practically, was the person who died youngest. So it's by no means, you, you, you're, you're optimising probabilistically, but you're not, you're not guaranteeing anything. No. Um, the... Uh, the other point is that um, I think that Buddhist observation is absolutely right. Um, you don't see many Buddhists jogging, do you? Um, <laughs> to be sitting down, um, under a tree, ideally, I think. Um, but, but the, um, I, I think also we always think that if we optimise for the information that's available, we're optimising for the situation as a whole. Mm. And what we tend to do is we take a number of things which are easy to quantify, we optimize for those, and then we declare what meets those criteria best is the best thing overall. Now, I'll give you a lovely example of this, which is I was having a conversation about decision science and saying, if you go to a property website, what you're dealing with is information about location, information about price, and possibly information about positives, right? So um, you'll be told if it's in a good school district, good school catchment area. You'll be told if it's got a balcony, if it's got a garden, if it's got parking, okay? Now, interestingly, what you should be optimizing for is an, a load of information which isn't currently available, which is negatives that you personally don't care about. So if you don't have school aged children or rather your children have left school, my children are at university. If I moved house, I wouldn't give a shit about the school district. Right. As I said, it could be in the catchment area of St. Trackhead's Academy. Wouldn't really bother me that much. Right. I'm not I, I'm not bothered about being next door to a pub. OK, uh, because I never go to sleep before midnight anyway. Um, and I like pubs. and I like the noise that I don't want to live next to a violent pub. Right. I don't want a car getting trashed or people lobbing tankards through my window. But if it's a civilized pub with beer garden conversation going on, doesn't bother me in the slightest. Right. Uh, railway lines don't bother me. They stop at midnight. OK, there are a whole lot of things which a lot of people consider negatives that I don't care about. Now, those are actually quite important because if I factor those in, if they were available, which they're not because the state agents never list negatives. OK. Um, the other thing that people do is they choose a location and they're choosing a location really just to make the choice manageable. Mm. Now, maybe you come from the valleys, so moving to a neighbouring valley would be unthinkable, wouldn't it? <laughs> the people in the next valley are absolutely detestable, horrible people. Yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My, my grandfather's from Tredegar. My father went back to uh, meet one of the people who'd worked with them in my, uh, doctor, my grandfather's GP surgery. And she, you won't believe this, okay, she's from Tredega. And she said of her daughter, she said, she married a man from Abertillery, but they seem to get on quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Bear in mind, for other people listening to this, they're 11 miles apart, okay? Yeah. Abertillery and Tredega are 11 miles apart. But nonetheless, okay, we look in locational terms, often in quite an arbitrary way. Mm. If you talk to a human estate agent, and particularly a good human estate agent, they will tell you one really interesting thing. When someone comes to them looking for a house, okay, and comes with a list of criteria, 
the house they ultimately buy generally ends up meeting very few of the criteria they set in advance. Mm. And that's probably true of wives, girlfriends, husbands as well. You know, the person you end up, you know, married to generally doesn't ha isn't the person you expected in advance. And we're not brilliant hedonic forecasters. And we're not also, you know, as Bill Gates once said of technology, people don't know how to want the things we can offer them. You know, there are a lot of things which a lot of products, it, well, it's difficult working in advertising because there are a lot of products which, unless you've used them, you don't really get it. I mean, the craziest thing I bought, which is the classic case of this, is this thing called the Quokka, which is, you know, it's boiling water on tap in your kitchen. So it's a tap that basically is a, a permanent kettle. Heavily insulated thing. It, I was looking at this thing. We had our kitchen done, and I, I, it's a bit of a tough deal with my wife, which is she cares more about aesthetics. I care more about functionality. So if you're going to get some attractive flooring, I want a gadget, you know, mm. you know, a Wi-Fi enabled washing machine or something, right? Okay. And um, as a result, we ended up with this cooker thing. I, I spent like, you know, you know, a, a three-figure sum on a bloody kettle. And it's only really when you realise, well, actually, I need boiling water eight times a day. It means I drink more tea and less coffee, so I save money in other ways. You know, um, it's re great for cooking rice. You know, if you want to poach an egg in the morning, it's, it's you know, it, you know, you don't wait for the kettle. And you suddenly realise, actually, this is five times more useful than I really envisage. But there are an awful lot of things where you don't know until you've tried it. And... In the case of property, you don't know until you've had a looky-loo. Mm. And typically, there are people who basically go, I want a cottage in the country with roses around the door, and they end up living in a flat overlooking the sea. You know, because you know, a very large amount of property is just some weird feeling of what feels right. Mm. And uh, there are a hell of a lot of things that make a property feel right aren't really definable in advance. One thing... Um... I really wanted to, to ask you about, um, obviously, I'm a, I'm a podcaster, I put out a lot of episodes, and I remember I was speaking to a friend um, two weeks ago, and I really wanted him to listen to a specific episode, and I said, what do you listen to podcasts on? And he said, oh, TikTok. I said, well, how do you listen to a podcast on TikTok? He said, no, I just listen to the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the clips of the best bits. He said, do you have any of those? And I remember thinking wow, are we at that point now where people can't have this attention span for 45 minutes? Do you think things like TikTok is, are killing a, attention span? Some people listen to audio books, accelerated times two, times yeah. 1. 1.5. Yeah. Um, so some people do listen to audio books at accelerated rate. Uh, podcast, podcast listeners, I think Pocket Cast, which is the one I use, I think lets you do that as well. I don't yeah. tend to do it. Um, I have a bit of a problem with them, which is there is no way of skim reading audio. OK, you can meta tag it, but there isn't a way of skim reading audio, really. Mm. Um, I, um, uh, it might, you know, I, I've noticed that some of my podcast appearances, because my kids keep saying, all my friends keep saying, why is your dad on TikTok? <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for it because, you know, a percentage of those people might go on to listen to the main thing and, you know, yeah. You know, all, all publicity is good publicity at some level in, in, in some respects. Well, not entirely true, but you know what I mean. Mm. Um, uh, and, but um, th there is an issue because I have a problem, which is um, uh, I, I, I quite like listening to podcasts and audio books on, on high-quality audio. Mm. I can't really listen to them on a phone, and I like listening to them on headphones, but the problem is you, headphones don't really work when you're married. Uh, I, I know it sounds a weird thing to say. If you live alone, you make quite a lot of use of headphones. But there's always this, you know, basically you'll have to, answer, you know, once you're married, you've got to answer a question about every five minutes. And I think also spouses hate it when the other parties are listening to headphones. Yeah. It's sort of sending out the message, you're deliberately ignoring me. Yeah. Um, so I always think that the headphone market is a bit of a bachelor market or a, you know, spinster market for that reason. I also, as an old person, I can't get my head around in-ear headphones. They've got to be over-the-air cans. I can't mm. do it with in -ear. Um, okay. I don't know whether it's with a bloody evolved shape of my ears <laughs> or whether it's 
an age thing, but I've never been very comfortable with them. They always kind of irritate me. Uh, in a way, weirdly, over-the-ear headphones, unless you listen for hours on end, don't. Um, but I, I, I sympathise with him because um, uh, it would be good if, at the very least, podcasts came with, you know, as net, Netflix isn't always good. Sometimes I need, to, before I can decide to watch a film, I kind of need to read five or six sentences. Hmm. Yeah. Because I don't want to get I don't want to get sunk cost committed into something where you don't really want to finish it, but you know I've committed twenty five minutes to begin with, so I might as well keep going. I don't want that to happen, and I'm always slightly frightened of you know effectively starting something and then being forced to finish it. And so I do think there's a lot to be said for the what you might call the two hundred words of judicious text, which just explains what's going on. Hmm. One thing. Um... They, they are saying about TikTok in particular is that because of its, you know, it, it's sharp, it rewards capturing attention. So if you put out a video, I think it's the first 10 listens, the first 10 plays dictate how well the video is pushed. So if you capture someone's attention for 100% of the video, then you're rewarded and it, and it gets pushed out. So people tend to try and create videos that are as short as possible. So 15 seconds, you can keep someone's attention. A minute, they think, I can't do that. that that's very, very interesting. So, yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, I mean, I like TikTok. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to use that terrible phrase, it is what it is. Yeah. But actually, what it is, I like, okay? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it if it completely replaced all cinema, television, and, and audiovisual entertainment. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but at the same time, it is part of something I see, which is a trend towards the two extremes, which is... You know the box set binge at the one at the one extreme, which no one really anticipated. Uh, but um, you know, so it is part of that what I call the, you know the bifurcation where it's short form, long form. Yeah. I'm a huge, huge fan of YouTube, mm. and one of the things I think one of the things that I think will be a major trend, which won't be talked about enough, just as Zoom isn't talked about enough as an important technology is watching you. I actually am one of the relatively minuscule number of people who subscribes to YouTube premium. But, but so, so I like it. And I, I um, but you're right. I mean, uh, that's one of the reasons why so many TikToks come with the exhortation to watch till the end yeah. or you won't believe how this ends. Yeah. Which is basically it's an algorithm happening. And unfortunately, this is the problem with all those algorithms, which is they don't capture everything which is a quality content. And as, as a result, people start gaming the system. And that, that's problematic, undoubtedly. Amazing. Well, last quick thing I wanted to ask you last, about. No, no problem at all. Thank you. Um, this is the last quick thing I wanted to ask you about. You, there's a story where you spent 24 hours in a Qatari jail. I just wonder... Were there any takeaways? Were there any lessons? Because to me, that sounds like the most scary thing ever. <laughs> it was. Um, and actually, um, uh, because I had no idea really, as it happened, okay, I have no really... I was vaping on a plane. I was an idiot, but equally I had a slight defence, which is that the, 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 they were tiny little vapes, okay? And I was just toking them very, very... Um, uh, I was then told I was then told to stop, and I stopped. And I thought, okay, that's the end of it. Um, and then, stupidly, I made the mistake of holding one in my hand, just as a kind of smoker's comforter. But the next thing I knew is I had this bit of paper saying, you know, and I assume you just pay a fine and board the flight, the on or the onward flight to London. And in the end, I ended up being taken off the plane, my passport confiscated, variously handcuffed. Um, the problem was, is I had no meat. Your mobile phone was confiscated, so. Uh, it was it was through the good offices of a very nice cop who told me to phone my wife now, because if you don't phone your wife now, even though it's four o'clock in the morning in London, you'll never get another chance for 24 hours. I had a very, very lucky. Um, I would have gone completely nuts. I think I was very lucky in the in the prison, which was perfectly reasonable, by the way. I mean, I mean you know, it, it, it wasn't pleasant. I wouldn't choose to stay there. But nor was it Midnight Express. Uh, the justice system worked reasonably well, although I didn't quite understand why I got fined 150 quid and the person who smoked a real cigarette on a plane. I don't understand why they ban vaping on planes anyway, because they allow alcohol on planes and the amount of agony that alcohol causes in flight 
with drunkards and general idiots must be, you know, 50 times more than any inconvenience that we caused by people, you know, vaping odorless e-cigarettes. OK. But anyway, let's park that particular objection. Um, I don't understand why they allow nuts on planes either. I like nuts. I'm not allergic to nuts. But I can survive for 10 hours without nuts if it means someone doesn't have an anaphylactic attack. You know, uh, I, I, there are a lot of things about these rules which I don't really understand. Um, and on a few flights, I've been told, look, mate, if you want to vape, just go in the loops. That's what we all do. That's what the cabin crew say. Um, um, but I, I was very lucky because there was a guy in there who was English who had lived in Qatar for about four years. He was currently living in Kuwait, but he lived in Qatar for four years. And he said, look, this will take longer than you expect. In 24 hours or so, we will go to some sort of trial. The trial will be reasonably just and fair and reasonable. There is no, don't, don't think, because you, you, you're not sure, don't think you're being effectively fitted up for a bribe because Qatar isn't like that, okay? Right. So don't assume this is one of those cases where basically what they're doing is messing you around. Just go along with the whole flow of the thing. It's very difficult because 24 hours without reading matter for me. They confiscate your phone. The only book allowed inside is the Quran in Arabic, which is a given that I don't read Arabic. Um, you know, it was 24 hours of kind of sensory deprivation. Um, but I knew, in fairness, OK, it was tolerable for me because I knew as a Brit there were diplomatic channels through which you could go to get some sort of redress. What was slightly terrifying is there are people in there who are, for example, Nepalese or Filipino. Now, you know, I don't imagine that the Nepalese embassy or the Filipino embassy carries quite the same clout uh, with the authorities. Uh, but also, you know, they were in there for things like having a girlfriend. OK. There were people in prison because, you know, they had basically been in the presence of a person of the opposite sex who wasn't an immediate blood relative without a chaperone being present. And bang, that for both male and female, that's a jailable offence. Now, if they hadn't got the money to pay the fine, OK, that's pretty painful. So I, you know, uh, it, it did become thanks to the offices of this English guy who basically worked, told me how the system was going to work. Uh, and also spoke English, I was much better off than I would have been otherwise. But that's that's the... Um, uh, um, so, I mean, uh, it, is, it is a good thing to do, and I know I wouldn't have said it at the time, because it's having complete loss of freedom is not something you can recreate in the imagination. No. You can't basically go, I wonder what it would be like, well, I suppose unless you're into serious bondage or something, um, I wonder what it would be like to be completely powerless to have all your contact with the outside world removed okay and to have you know short of getting into a cave diving accident okay there's no other way you can recreate it in the imagination and to the extent that you know what does not kill you makes you stronger it, it was a worthwhile experience to actually endure hmm. you know i'm not being i'm not being hypercritical you know personally i think you know the, the thing should have been dealt with with a fine um, and it didn't really require a custodial um, uh, sentence. It wasn't custodial, really. it was, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, the, the justice system seemed to work well for me. Uh, I'm not so sure, if, you know, if I hadn't had enough money to pay the fine. And ha having written about it in The Spectator, I was contacted by other family members of people who've been in Middle Eastern jails for months or years. In many cases, what will happen, for example, is if you start a business and it goes bankrupt and your two business partners hoof it, uh, and you're left as the guy who signed that signed what are now dud checks, okay, um, you could end up basically unable to, you know, leave the country or leave the prison without, you know, a payment of half a million pounds or something, mm. and that's terrifying. And one good thing about it is it makes you really appreciative of living in Britain. I can imagine. Because you, you do not, we do not realise the extent to which, um, uh, you know, generally things proceed with a high degree of respect for individual liberty and, you know, and also relatively low levels of bureaucracy as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, I can't begin to imagine the 
the things that may happen in the as Qatar hosts the the Football World Cup this winter. Uh, uh, well, well, what what happens if you know if there's drunken behaviour? God only knows. God only knows. Well, Rory, thank you so much. I know we've gone over the time a little bit, so I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for joining me on the Freedom Pack podcast today. It's been a pleasure right. to have you on. All the best to you. All the best to Pontypridd as well. Thanks. <laughs> Amazing. Speak soon.